Good morning, good evening, good night, NBN Entrepreneurship and Leadership. Personally, I'm fascinated by the story. Trust is an underrated weapon in the business landscape. I'm a really, really strong believer in learning by doing. What's the definition of success? You're trying to come up with an answer to the question. But go ahead, Richard. Uh, you could be right, but you're wrong. <laughs> this is a bit of an unusual podcast in that this is the one where we introduce why we're doing it and what it's all about. And I'd like to kick off by asking my co-host and business partner, Kimon Fontakidis, to introduce himself. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, my story is uh, maybe somewhat unusual. Anyway, I am an American who ended up living in Krakow, Poland. I ended up founding two companies, um, one called PMR, which does market research, um, consulting, and some business publications, and another one called Argos Multilingual, which is basically a translation and localization company. It helps global companies get their content into lots of other languages. Um, I think the combined companies, they employ you know, well over 200 people. Um, and I, I don't know what the revenues are, maybe eh, like over 30, maybe $30 million of, of revenue. So, you know, whatever, just sort of like nice size companies. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a fun ride. How about you, Richard? How did you get into this uh, entrepreneurship and business world? Well, I actually, t yesterday was, we're recording this in, on the 1st of February 2021, and yesterday was the 30th anniversary of my move to Poland, which is quite a, so I, that means I've been in Poland for 30 years, and I'm British by birth and origin, but I'm a Polish citizen as you are now. I've, I'm, I've spent most of my life in Poland because I'm 54 years old, and I have been involved in many businesses and was very lucky to meet you and invest in Argos and PMR when they were much, much smaller businesses than they are today. Yeah, but you've invested in, I mean, Argos and PMR, I mean, your list of companies, Richard is a serial investor. I mean, how many companies have you invested in? Probably about 30, 35 altogether. I've started or been there right at the beginning. And of those, 19 are no longer with us. And <laughs> that, that's, actually, that's actually not such a bad strike rate. Um, yeah. The, but the... But the first company I ran that achieved some kind of market success was called SKK, which was doing barcode scanners, printers, labels, and software. And basically in the 1990s, that was the first company of its type in Poland after the end of communism. And the money I made doing that was what I invested in in the companies Kimon founded, and that's how we got into business together. So, so yeah, on a high level, I've done only two, and Richard's done 30. So I think we have different types of lessons. I think I've come from a in-depth, I've been grinding it out, all the details of the business, and Richard, Richard has been like a super investor. Like, uh, I think you've seen a lot of, you've seen, a, basically you've seen a lot more than me, probably. Our, ex from our experiences are different, and but we, we overlap and we've got, you know, as foreigners who came to Poland, both for personal reasons and then both went into business, not in the sort of big corporate world. We've got quite a lot of things in common and there are significant differences, which actually is one of the reasons we think this podcast should be a good listen. But I've been podcasting for longer. You're new to it, Kimon. And why did you want to, why did you want to get involved in this channel? What was your, what's well, your big reason? Well, I'm actually, I'm, I'm personally, I'm fascinated by, uh, the story and what makes people become entrepreneurs basically because it's 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 such a rare um i mean i, I don't know i don't know how many people wish they had their own business or or, or 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 set out to you know they have all those statistics about the one in ten succeeds and all that stuff but um the people we're going to invite are, are going to obviously be people that have a, had some degree of success. And so I think it's just going to be fascinating to try to understand what do these people have in common? Um, I, I, you know, we've actually already recorded a couple of episodes and I can already sense like some of the commonalities that are come through. Um, and, and we can talk about these, Richard. I mean, the one that's so, sort of come out, I think with almost everybody is, is what we would call grit, which means just never giving up, keep trying, not being afraid to ask questions, um, ready to do um, sort of crappy things <laughs> for a long yeah, time. It's, it's very interesting because I, I, I totally agree with what Kimon said. And I, I was three times CEO, twice in one company and once in PMR, which Kimon 
founded and but a lot of the time I haven't been in charge whereas Keeman built up particularly Argos Smartlingual to be you know like top 50 in the world one of the top 50 in the world so a really big market success so our experiences as leaders were different but there's this concept of like the self-confident entrepreneur which in the sort of stereotype is a very arrogant person but we've both observed that the really good leaders are quite humble because they they've got enough self-confidence to know that to know that they're not perfect and not to admit that and not be afraid to admit they're wrong not be well ultimately they're also smart enough to realize that they're dependent on a whole bunch of other people to be successful so um nobody wants to hang out with sort of um somebody that's full of themselves and that seems to know that seems to always have the right answers yeah i mean we're we're at the beginning of this because as as uh as is obvious if you look at the the page on the mbn channel there's a lot of interviews that i did prior to starting doing them together with Keeman and not all entrepreneurs are the same and obviously we're only going to invite people onto the show who we think are we think are interesting and and quite a few will be from our personal network and then we're sort of looking around but although these are our observations it's going to be very interesting for us when we when we meet someone who challenges our assumptions because so I threw out grit is my first one I have a couple others but why don't you throw out like what are you interested in like what are you trying to uh like, what do you want to hear about from these from these people? Well, well, I've been really interested in entrepreneurship as a sort of approach to life, partly because I think it's for people who don't necessarily fit in. Right now, in th- at the time we're recording this, entrepreneurship has become very fashionable with sort of sort of celebrity status, big media entrepreneurs, but. A while back, it just wasn't the case that maybe in Europe, it might be different in America, but in Europe, being an entrepreneur wasn't wasn't so cool. And it was the sort of classic route for someone who didn't fit into the normal structures of society. And, you know, they didn't have the personal skills or the, the good looks to smooth their way through the corporation. And I'm really interested in the background, the childhood, what sort of upbringing people had, how far were they spoiled, were their parents very strict or did they push them or, you know, what was their schooling like? Was it from society, friends, family? Where? Did yeah, that's a big one. That's a big one for me as well. Education, you're sort of touching on education. I think that's one you and I, Richard went to prestigious uh, college, uh, Cambridge. And uh, that's right. Uh, yes, I, Oxford. I, I come from this sort of this sort of privileged British educationally privileged British background my father was a professor in Oxford I studied at Cambridge and a lot of the people there come from you know whether they're very smart or very privileged basically you're not growing up with a typical bunch of people where the expectations are very high and your peer group is destined by their birth and Right, Genetic and, 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 and the counterbalance to that, that's why I think it's so interesting also, why I think it's kind of fun that we're, we're doing it together, is that I come from a completely, so I also, I mean, I came from a privileged background, a middle class background, um, I went to university, but like my experience with university was, like basically it was party town in USA, and it wasn't, um, you know, I didn't really put any work into it, and I didn't really get anything out of it, and, 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 and I, I'm a really, really strong believer in learning by doing and 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 i'm not saying that this is and this is going to come out throughout the thing is that you know i'm this is definitely not there's not only one way to get into the finish line there's not only one way to be successful but i do think that um just at least from my perspective um like i don't hold education is as high regard as a lot of other people no and and i also think it's remarkable when i look at my my education and this is confirmed by talking to many entrepreneurs from many different countries how the things that are really useful in business aren't the things that lead to business success sorry the things that are really useful in business aren't taught by the universities and the high schools so you know it's get it things like being well organized having good interpersonal skills being good at time management yeah i know you're big on that yeah you're big on quantifying those types of things like time management's always been a big one for you but but they're Um, just not taught you know and so you can get to you can be extremely academically talented get a first class degree and never have a five or ten minutes on how to run a meeting effectively and so you get these people who are extremely clever and it wouldn't take them long to pick up the basic skills but they've not been taught and then people expect them just to so much of it though and 
this is what's interesting, and this comes out with a couple of the guests as well. Some of it, I think, is just human skills, like actually knowing people and knowing how to interact with people and knowing how to push buttons and try to get various responses and uh, from from people. So I don't know whether it's like social psychology or just your just your general sort of. Um, so you know emotional intelligence uh, well, your ability I, to handle people and I came in you were downplaying your intelligence but I know you studied psychology and I've often thought that no no I was not downplaying my intelligence I was downplaying my education uh, well I mean <laughs> you know let's say it, it, it would be very difficult to downplay your enormous intelligence obviously because that would be ridiculous but the um, the point I was going to make was that the psychology I noticed that you were very good at like forming judgments on people, not always right, but very good at it compared to many people. I remember you asked three questions, like when you went into negotiation, it was um, what do they say they want, what do they think they want, and what do they really want? And there's this concept that people, other people don't aren't always completely rational and standard sales, sales training will be ask questions, figure out what they want, yeah. but there's this deeper level of sort of like looking what's behind the answers, which I, I mean, the classic is when you, and, and this is beyond, okay, you can be selling your, you can be selling a service or a product, but also like if you're in the startup world and you're trying to get investors, you know, a, a lot of people focus on themselves and that's the really, that's, that's the big mistake. You need to focus on the, 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 the other side. Like what does, what does the person you're talking to really want? What do they really care about? Do they even really care at all about the problem that you're trying to solve? And maybe you should be talking to them about something else. Um, but back to the education thing, it was funny because Richard, you asked me to sort of guest uh, lecture in one of your, because you actually teach entrepreneurship and which I find, I found to be such a foreign concept. How can I, how can you possibly teach entrepreneurship? I mean, I know you can, I think, and maybe you're your tactic was to give just to hey here's an example of an entrepreneur look but I, i'm not sure like are you able to teach entrepreneurship it's a it's a it's a question on which the uh, there's more than one opinion and they're quite they don't you know there are strong conflicting opinions on that one but there's definitely if it's well if it's done badly i say there are two types of entrepreneurship profession professor there are the zoologists who sort of study entrepreneurs in the same way that a zoologist studies animals and they sort of like see what the entrepreneur eats and what you know how much exercise it needs and then there are the entrepreneurship uh uh, academics who like are a bit more like the racehorse or the d trainer or the dog trainer who actually teach the entrepreneur to be a better entrepreneur and I'm 100% convinced that a well like, and, and the people who've been entrepreneurs tend to be better mentors and instructors instructors and lecturers because they've been there and they've done that and they know what they're talking about and so you know provided someone's got the right preparation they can definitely tell people lots of useful things and it's sometimes they're very basic not very academic things like if you want to be an entrepreneur you need to get good at handling rejection just simple stuff you know you, you meet this famous guy and he says there's a guy in Cambridge called uh, Jonathan Milner who's set up the first antibody uh, he could manufacture antibodies which he was selling to pharma companies and the company was almost out of business nothing was working and he was wandering around the labs of Cambridge with a bucket full of ice and and test tubes full of these um, antibodies and you know these days he looks like the chairman of a big public listed com company because he is but back back in the day he was doing really sort of low prestige stuff and just hearing that you know the people who are famous now were doing really basic things at the start of the journey and you know, yeah making sure that people realize that that's real it's not just Hollywood it's it's actually real I mean, can you, I'm sure you've done because one of the things for our listeners you know we've both built up companies from the start we've seen the you know and it's it's sometimes it's blood fun. sweat and tears it, sometimes it's fun sometimes it's cool sometimes it, you know everyone's impressed but other times but usually but usually it's boring is <laughs> just boring. mundane tasks it's getting the small stuff right that's it's really it's not is it sexy and it's it's getting the small stuff right like consistently i would say is a huge is a huge piece of it yeah you have an or even like you're doing something that sounds very exciting and so making a strategy but at the end of the meeting you have to sit down and write it down right. do a meeting summary just distribute it to the people who were there put a date on it and if you don't do that you just end up with chaos so it's a mixture you said something 
that um, maybe we should call the podcast the zoologist because the, the actual, the actually, that's at least that's how I am understanding. That's what I'm interested in is observing is what are the what's the makeup of all these different of all these different interesting people and like what drove them to do what they did because you know we're still talking about a relatively small number of people <clears throat> that actually make it and trying to understand those commonalities i just think i personally think that's i think that's fascinating actually yeah, I, I, I i totally totally with you on that and i think i think that it's uh, you know as someone I, we're also trying to like draw out lessons that if i hear people saying things that either is a perfect example because we ask people to give examples a perfect example of you know the problems of recruiting people it's very hard when you start a business to get people to come on board and join your company because you're competing against the big IT companies the Unilevers the government and then you've got crazy Richard or weird Keeman with their little four person startup and you know your mother and father and your friends are going to be really surprised you decide to join a little company rather than a normal yeah, one because that's why they're usually the weird ones that join as well yeah well <laughs> some, some uh, to any of our wonderful <laughs> co-workers listening we're not about yeah, you. I think so. Honestly, you know, it takes you. You're, you know, Richard, you're 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 actually hitting the nail on the head. I mean, you know, it you have to be able to take some risk, also from an employee perspective. Okay. That you're ready to join. Wow, this chemo or this Richard. I mean, they sound like they have a good idea and they seem passionate about it. But um, you know, I'm, it's not going to be. You know, is it going to be as safe a job as 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 going to some other job or? So you know, it's it is it definitely takes certain people um, to to join those companies as well. Yes, yeah, so, so so it's but you know, pulling out the lessons and you know, I, I think one of them and some of the lessons that I draw from thinking a lot of about entrepreneurship is the things that work for entrepreneurs work for life. That you know, if you for example, this humility and leadership, you know, not not being the know it all who tells everyone what to do. It's actually a very useful skill for the rest of life as well. You know, the guy who the the annoying boss is the annoying guy at the party and vice versa, I would say, very very often. But I don't know that's going to come out, but it's interesting for us. And I think because we're both interested in entrepreneurship and have been entrepreneurs for decades and the people we're interviewing typically they may not have been doing it for as long as us because we're both in our 50s I so Keeman is slightly younger than me he's, he's much the, much slight, much slightly, younger slightly young he's slightly younger than me um and but he's still in his 50s he's quite an old man uh, <laughs> I've just barely crossed that threshold. In his 50s, <laughs> not more than 10 years away from 60. Anyway, he, we're both experienced in this, but what the other people we invite on typically will have had some, you know, some of them are extremely successful, others are successful. Although another important point is de what's the definition of success? And there are a couple of questions that we, and we, we, we each have things we're interested in. And, you know, we're going to take people through their their life story, their business story, trying to pick on major moments. So what are particular things that you like to ask people, Kimon, when you, you've you got an entrepreneur on the show and they're chatting away and there are particular things that you find interesting? You've got well, I mean, I, I've already mentioned, uh, I, I'm trying to sort of figure out about the grit, trying to figure out about the tenaciousness. Um, that's, I, I think that's something that I like, that I also want to just show. I think that's going to be one, a commonality that we're going to see. The education one that we mentioned, because already we've had both sides of the spectrum, people that haven't graduated from college, high school even, and people, uh, you know, that have, uh, that are very well educated. So, you know, th there's both arguments there. Um, I like to ask about competitiveness. I'm always curious, were people like playing sports and how much was the will to win? And then where did that will come from? As sort of you were mentioning, like, was it the parents that created an environment where it was like, let's be very competitive in whatever we do? But my favorite one that I that I'm definitely going to ask everyone, and I think it sort of, um, I, I just think it's kind of interesting one is 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 the question about luck, is how much of your success do you attribute to your hard work and your skills versus how much is is luck, and how would you answer that question, Richard? It's a, I, I, I just want to continue. I, I will answer that question, um, and. 
I was going to do before that just in terms of the questions that we'll ask because I think it's nice to keep them all together because uh, you know we sometimes battle about structure normally Keeman's extremely well organized and structured and I'm all over the place um, sometimes it's the other way around that I, I think basically this is a huge BS story because you're trying to come up with an answer to the luck question but go ahead Richard you could be so you could be right but you're wrong <laughs> um, the, what uh, what I think is also interesting is I already mentioned the the family interest uh, who you're trying to impress that I think the degree of self-awareness in the entrepreneur is fascinating because very often that evolves that during their career certainly in my case that was the case that people's sense of who they are and what they want to achieve in life is dramatically changed by business success that, that you know they they thought it was all about X and when they get there they realize it's not all about X, which is why I like asking people where they're going next, that, you know, once someone's achieved some level of business success, it's not at all obvious what they want to do next. And usually what people want to do next is not guaranteed, which means that it's much more challenging for someone to move from where they are now to their future goals. It's easy to look back and say, well, I made it to here because they know they've made it. So, so I like asking people where they go next. Coming to luck, I think I was extremely fortunate in some ways that although there were some painful aspects of it, coming to Poland at the time I did meant that I, the, the, the savings I had from working in the UK went a lot further here. So I was able to get into the Polish business environment in the early days. And although it was extremely demanding, given how lamentably primitive my business skills were, I got into an environment where, you know, you could buy things for one and sell them for four at scale. And if you can't make a lot of money doing that, then there's something wrong. We were... We weren't quite monopolists, but there were very other few people in the country doing what we did. And it's I think it is harder now. There are more opportunities, but it is it is harder now than it was back then. So I'd say, yes, I had a lot of luck and I worked like crazy for a very long time. I really I really worked and worked and I didn't regret it. I didn't feel it was work. I was I was building building the company. So it didn't it wasn't a painful type of work, but it was work, I would say. Oh, yeah, I would say that you're not. Um, I think you're 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 you're, you're being um, you have somehow gotten to that position and, you know, um, well, you make your own, I, we, people say they make their own luck. Yeah. I think I think you did it. I did it. And but it's it's getting yourself into a situation where you're ready to exploit the luck if it comes by as well. That you know, for example, the classic is having savings. If you have a lot of stuff on credit, you've got an expensive a boyfriend who's blowing all your money on stupid stuff, or a girlfriend. You've got relationships which suck cash out of your bank account, and you've got a lifestyle that sucks cash out of your bank account which are very often the same thing that you have to have a big flat screen tv because all your friends have got the same things and you hang out with people who are impressed by that sort of stuff that you might have a great opportunity but you can't afford to take it because you've got yourself locked into a, a situation where you need to go and earn the next month yeah it's 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 um i completely agree um obviously uh not being I mean, you and I are very similar in the, in, in the respect that we just don't care about material assets and material things that much. So that's never been an issue for either of us. And I think a lot of people get caught up. But I think, once again, that's the do ego. You I, list, do you want me to list all the extravagant things you do, Kim? <laughs> Um, I can tell, tell, tell them about the island. Too. Well, I mean, I think I think there's a lot of ego uh, that gets wrapped up into stuff. And, you know, and I think think that the the bigger the issue you have with your ego the more you end up getting stuff and the more that like um sort of that definition of success uh is wrapped up around you and how many people know you and how many people have heard of you and stuff like that so i do think that that's uh i do think that that's a barrier but you know the the luck thing it's you know it's it's a, it's a slippery slope because like i i i i always you know Basically, as you said, I, I tell people, I do believe you sort of create your own luck, but I think a big piece of it, and it's sort of an interesting one, um, and it has come out in the stories as well that we've already talked to, is that people seize the moment. It's also not being afraid to take a chance. It's not being, it's not being afraid um, to gamble on something. And, 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 and in my personal case, I think I'd, I'd say that that's one of my, let's say, bigger strengths. I'm ready to risk and I'm ready to make a decision fast. 
And if I believe in it, if I have the gut instinct that this is worth trying, I'm, I'm ready to give it a shot, basically. And I, and I think that that was the same. I, I have to believe that was the same for you. You somehow met those. Come on, you didn't speak any Polish or barely. I'm not sure how good your Polish was. And you just met some guys and you said, hey, got, like somehow you got them to go into business with you. I remember you even telling me the story. you like, and this is, I think the best part about it is like, you guys like wrote something down on the back of an envelope. Like, this is how many shares I'm going to have. This is how many shares you're going to have. And then you went ahead and you spent all your money on the basis of that back of the envelope. And, and that's, I mean, so, you know, <laughs> I mean, not a lot of like, I think not a lot of people would do that. And I think that's a nice little sort of piece of the, 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 that you sort of left out. I mean, cause you just basically said here, you, you, you fronted the money in, on the basis of the back of an envelope contract. So I, I'd say that you know, that's I, mean, a, I, I do think that trust is an underrated weapon in the business landscape that obviously you have to be careful and, you know, you wouldn't do a huge transaction like selling a company or buying a house without the legals in place, but you can agree quite major things based on a based on a handshake. It's a good idea to write down what it is and, you know, there was a lack of professionalism to the way I did it that didn't address. Sure. That didn't but address. also the bureaucracy, because I think another thing you and I hate is BS. Like, do we really want to go through massive bureaucracy? It's just, it's better to trust. Trust is the slayer of bureaucracy basically um trust is about efficiency <clears throat> actually trust is richard that's one we have to ask we, we actually haven't asked anybody about trust i think trust is a super interesting question it's a great question it's because, a great question and because we're uh that's another thing we both have in common <clears throat> and i've taken the <clears throat> personal approach that i'm gonna get screwed over but the roi of trusting everybody and getting screwed over in my case, has proven to be fantastic. Yeah, yes. By, by RO, you mean the return on investment rate? Yes. It's, it's the um, the idea that there's a payback to trust, and there's certainly well, no, there's a cost. There's an idea that there's a cost to trust, and the or cost, cost of, a, a, a of, of sorry, the cost of a lack of trust yeah. is I have to micromanage, I have to check, I have to have contracts in place, and that is extraordinarily inefficient. It's and and so like that's something actually that you and I really have because you did the same thing um, that we just described with the back of the envelope thing, and I think it, I, I've done that like countless times. Um, in, in, in my business history. Yeah, and, it, and, and it, there's, there's a student from an African country who had a scholarship to Scandinavia. He had a very impressive CV. I remember he came to Poland and I basically thought that possibly we could replicate what I'd done in Poland, where, where he came from, which was Ghana. And, you know, I gave him some money in a barcode scanner and then I got a fax about three months later saying, send more money. And none of the things that were he had committed to actually happened and you know maybe maybe he was just unlucky maybe it went wrong but I, t I i lost it all and that's not the that's not the most i've lost i've lost much more in other things but but ultimately you go into these things with your eyes open and, and you yeah but you also trusted me even getting into business and you barely knew me you barely knew the businesses i was involved in you put up a bunch of money um yeah, and you true. know it worked out. I mean, I could have been a different person and it could have been a different, yeah. you could have had a different outcome there. And, and, and you know, and, <clears throat> and the lessons are so hard to generalize from. There are other people where I did broadly the similar thing and it went horribly wrong. Right, <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> so, so you can't say, so please, you know, and, and I think that that's one of the, well, that's one of the things I hope we'll do with this podcast is we'll have experienced business people who've done something, men and women who've done something achieved something sharing their lessons will be commenting and comparing it to ours and it's so much better to hear about someone else's catastrophe and then think oh well i don't want to do what richard did 20 years later because you know there are, i also made genuine mistakes and i think i think we'd both admit that from time no, to time i i, 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 I didn't unlike you i did not make mistakes you never not a not a not a not a, not a mistake <laughs> no it's 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 it's, it's an, and we've got this big pool of shared experiences some different ones one of the things that i like doing is sharing from one of my teaching experiences i do workshops in schools and preschools universities high schools and i remember someone asked me a question about what sort of business partners you should look for and i was reflecting on that when you were reflecting on you trusting me or me trusting you at the start of the business and i said that you have to be a bit careful if you're early on in your business career because your first business partners it's a bit like first boyfriend or girlfriend you're so happy that someone wants to go into business with you you accept them without being as critical as you 
become later once you've had been through a few relationships and you realize that you realize that there's, there's there's more than one criteria and there were four students sitting together and i said for example you have to check there isn't one person one person in the team who's not really pulling their weight and you know has, has got involved and is sort of happily egging everyone else everyone else on to work like crazy but isn't very good at anything and there was a group of four students and three of them all looked at the, looked at the one in the middle and it was obvious that he was that guy you and know, I'm so. afraid that's and, and I feel like the, I'm that guy <laughs> you're, you're the guy <laughs> the guy adding the guy adding the lead, the guy that had the questionable value the, the questionable value um, yeah, Kim is also modest I, mean, I, I know many of the people who've worked <laughs> with and for him in the sort of in the upper echelons of the company and down at the coalface in you know because sometimes Krakow is a small city you sometimes meet people socially who you know turn out, turns out they work in the company and the culture of the company is what the leadership defines and I, oh by the way I'm very interested in leadership and there's something about an approach and values and attitude and example which permeates a culture and you know if that's the only thing you did it's incredibly rewarding for the people who work there as well so so i think you can um you can take that as a compliment but yeah no gonna, no it clearly 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 this podcast won't be just a string of reciprocal i don't know what there's a nasty word for that isn't it it won't be a reciprocal no we're not going to do that we're not going to say that word and i'm not going to compliment you anymore so we can just forget about that so i like, will end it on my compliment basically thank you um so maybe just in closing, like we, you know, anybody who's listening to this, our, uh, you know, at this point, this is this is our promo bit. So it'll just be friends, family, people in our network. Um, we encourage you guys to subscribe. We're gonna. This will be. Uh, I'll let Richard talk a little bit about. I think you should say a couple words about the new new books network. This will be available wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll definitely also have a video version on. Um, on YouTube, there'll be a channel there. So yeah, support us, subscribe. Um, if you, uh, we're gonna obviously be interested, we've got a quite a long list of um, uh, guests, but we're gonna always be looking for guests. If you know anybody super interesting that you want us to interview, whatever, give us a shout on uh, on LinkedIn or Twitter or any other social media that we use. Uh, you can find all that information, um, I think on the new books network page and i'll just hand it over to richard to yeah what, what, what i'll just that. add to that that you know we're really interested in nominations for speakers if you if you should figure out in the notes under this under this podcast how to subscribe you can reach us through linkedin or, or twitter um about the new books network i've recently invested in the new books network it's run by a, a very nice american called marshall poe who's a retired professor it's the largest author interview podcast network in the world it gets between 1.3 and 1.5 million downloads a month that's 60 or 70 percent up from six months ago so it's growing fast and the as the nbn grows it's moving beyond its roots of hosts interviewing authors about their new books to different different channels last week we interviewed an author as it happens but we're we're definitely looking for people who not just people who've written books and the reason I migrated my previous podcast onto the MBN is that there's a network effect that the more people who listen the more people get to know about different episodes and right now the MBN is belting out 12 podcasts a day which is quite a lot and it'll be going up so I don't do we have anything else so yeah if you like this subscribe share encourage people to join if you think of someone you'd like us to interview encourage them to get in touch with them and apart from that i think i'll let keeman just close close this podcast yeah i mean i can i can tell you that we've already had some interviews and like i'm like super enjoying this i mean like we've got some really really cool people um you know and some of them are from our networks and some of them are completely outside of our networks uh, actually hats off to you richard i don't know where you got some of the people that we got i think they're like they're fascinating um obviously the people that i know are fascinating as well <laughs> so uh yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I listen i'm just i'm 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 actually just honestly from my perspective i'm really enjoying this and i think you will too uh i think we're trying to get out you know just the the nice juicy juicy bits of the stories of these uh, interesting individuals and on that note let's end this podcast thank you very much for listening